in Christ. John Calvin in the Institutes uh, spends book two of the Institutes describing how the Father put all the blessings of salvation in the incarnate Son, and human salvation was walking around in one person at one point. When Christ was on the earth, human salvation was in him. It was, it was incarnate. That was salvation. Long time later, we come along, and for us, you know, just as for Peter and Paul, to be saved and be in Christ, they had to be joined to Christ. They had to have union with Christ. So at the very end of um, Institutes, book 2, chapter 16, Calvin has this wonderful uh, short passage. He says, we see that our whole salvation and all of its parts are comprehended in Christ. If we seek any gifts of the Spirit, they will be found in His anointing. Um, notice there, if we want gifts of the Spirit, we have to get Christ's anointing for reasons that I think Dr. McKinley just explained, right? We don't always think of Christ as being, uh, the word Christ as being the Messiah anointing spirit word, but it is, yeah. If we seek gifts of the Spirit, they're in His anointing, His Christing. If we seek strength, it lies in His dominion. If we seek purity, it lies in his conception, a reference here to the virginal conception. If gentleness, it appears in his birth. If we seek redemption, it's in his passion. If we seek acquittal, ours is in his condemnation. If we seek remission of the curse, it's in his cross. If satisfaction, in his sacrifice. If purification, it's in his blood. If we seek reconciliation, we find it in his descent into hell. If mortification of the flesh, in his tomb, mortification, putting to death. If newness of life, in his resurrection, and if immortality, in his resurrection. Um, Institutes 2.16, notice what's going on there. Benefits of union with Christ, that is salvation uh, applied on the first side, and always grounded in the work of Christ on the second side, salvation accomplished. So, by God's doing, you are in Christ, uh, 1 Corinthians 1.30, or literally there what it says is, of him are you in Christ. I, th I think that's actually, that reflects the Greek and it's what the King James Bible said, 1 Corinthians 1.30, of him are you in Christ. Um, to put that in better modern English, by God's doing you are in Christ, who became for us justification and sanctification and glorification. All of those uh, list of benefits flow out of that and grow out of that, but it's the being placed in Christ that gets it. We want all the benefits of the saving life of Christ, everything from his conception through his resurrection and ascension to sit at the right hand of the Father, still incarnate, by the way, the incarnation, the taking on of human nature. It's not eternal, hadn't always happened, it happened at a particular point in the fullness of time, but it's not temporary. He didn't just um, shuck off his body on the dark side of the moon as he ascended into heaven to pick it up on the way back. He's still incarnate. Um, he is joined for all time to human nature, so that we are for all time secured in the presence of God representatively. One of us is there. Our older brother, Christ, is there in the presence of God. That life is the one that justifies, and this has implications for the question of justification. So if you look at, the, if you look at your life and say, wow, this is not acceptable to God, what life is acceptable to God? There's only one right answer. The life of Jesus Christ is the one that's acceptable to God. What, what God said at the baptism and at the Mount of Transfiguration, this is my beloved Son, in Him I am well pleased. What is that besides an image of humanity really accepted and received by God? Now it's one thing you could look at that and say, that's not me, that's that guy in the Jordan River, that's Jesus over there. The whole point Calvin's making is, uh, the only way to be saved and accepted and justified is for that life to be your life. Now, we want the life of Jesus to be our life in every way it can be. The first way that it can be our life is there's this strong element of vicariousness. It's not yet about an internal transformation of, of you. It's about God doing this divinely creative act. It's a thought of association whereby he looks at the Son and says, this life counts as your life. This death counts as your death. Um, you could call it a legal fiction if you want. You can make fun of it in lots of ways. It's really popular in some circles to mock it these days and call it a courtroom view of justification or things like that. Uh, being an artist, I think of it as a creative view of justification whereby God does this massive 
feet of analogical thinking and says, this is this. Like, your life is this life. And when I look at the life of Jesus and say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This is, this is the son of God doing on earth what he always did in heaven. This is the one who from all eternity was at the right hand of the father as fully God and uh, received from the father all that the father is and gave back to him in a constant act of filial joy all that the father was in the communion of the life of the Trinity. That one is doing that same son thing in a human life. And God sees that in a human life and says, totally lovable, totally beloved, accepted. That's the life I want. God sees that life and counts it as ours. I want to state it that way and not say a bunch of negatives because the negatives are where you start getting in trouble where you say, and he doesn't see my sin at all because that's actually not true, right? I mean, you could say it in a sermon or a song or you could use it as a metaphor for the way you're forgiven, but it makes it sound like God is playing hide and seek with the real you and is somehow deceived about the actual state of your soul. He totally knows you're a sinner. And even when he counts Jesus' life as your life and says of you that you are acceptable for the sake of Christ, it's not because he's tricking himself, right? So a lot of well-intentioned youth leaders and worship leaders and preachers and even sometimes theologians will say things like, when God looks at me, all he sees is Jesus and he doesn't see my sins. You have to be careful how you say that, right? It's, it's attempting to portray something true about this vicariousness, but it, if you say it in a way that it, it says God is tricked or fooled or knows less than you do, it should just be kind of common sense that that can't be true, right? God must actually know the state of your uh, life as you live it. He has decided by his sovereign authority to count the life of Jesus as yours. That is the only life that justifies. Justification is only in Christ and is only available to us by faith, by believing the promise that God made way back with Abraham that he would justify the unrighteous. Don't look elsewhere for a life that justifies. So don't come up with, um, if you're desperately looking around for any other life to justify, you could say, well, maybe my life, if I get to spend thousands of years on purgatory practicing virtues and canceling vices, that would actually be this life I am living turned into a life acceptable to God. Maybe then God would accept me. You see what you've done there is you've taken the process of gradual growth in Christ-likeness and made it the condition for acceptance. It's the same as to say, when I am fully sanctified, then I will be justified and accepted. That's not the picture. The right picture is God accepts you in Christ, and then, I'm a Wesleyan, so I'm really excited about, he has a plan for actually making you holy. That's the other way that that Jesus life is going to take place in our lives, is for us to actually do things which um, constitute our lived lives as more Christ-like, so that we experientially die and rise with Christ in the sense of mortifying our members in the flesh, as Paul would say, um, putting to death the uh, desires uh, that are self-centered and curved in on ourselves and um, self-seeking, and bringing life to the new man. Um, so. Don't think of your own life as the one that can justify if you just had a few thousand years plus a special boost up Mount Purgatory. That's not it. Don't think of your life as the one that could justify if maybe you could pool your efforts with other cool holy people and maybe the whole community of the church could somehow be acceptable to God. As I know Dr. Peters will say tomorrow, no, the holiness of the church is not the kind of thing that plugs into your life and substitutes for your holiness. Only the holiness of Jesus Christ can do that justifying work. Now, I can say lots more things about justification by grace through faith, but notice the main thing going on is that the life of Jesus happens outside of you for you. It's got to be outside of you and then apply to you so that when you look for the life that is justified, you always look away. You always look away. Now, again, I said I'm a Wesleyan, which is just um, shorthand for I'm really excited about actual transformation of life into the likeness of Christ. Um, uh, if I were to have to pick a main danger out there in ways Christian salvation is portrayed, I have a mortal fear of it being portrayed as that forensic moment, that outside of you moment, being all there is to salvation. 
There's a weird version of Christianity that, out, that is out there. It goes by lots of different names, travels in lots of different traditions. But the basic idea is you have a moment of conversion somewhere in your life. Then you die and go to heaven for all eternity. Amen. But in between, there's nothing much to say about the Christian life. It's really waiting between this one thing that happened to you a long time ago and this other thing that's going to happen to you way, way in the future when you're dead. Again, that's this mythological way of thinking about how the life of Christ interacts with your life. Um, what John Wesley says is, God implants holiness into everyone to whom he imputes holiness. Implant, impute, I don't know if you're familiar with that language. Impute is this reckoning language. Um, it's God declaring a thing to be true of you. So notice Wesley sounding the properly Protestant note here and saying, how does God get holiness into you? He imputes it. He declares it to be there. He credits the righteousness of Christ to be yours and your unrighteousness to be punished in the death of Christ. It's an act of imputation. But notice he says it by saying, God implants or imparts, gives, really, really actually pushes into you holiness to everyone to whom he has imputed it. They go together. Charles Wesley um, could say this even shorter in the hymn, um, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, number one in every good Methodist hymnal and many other hymnals. Um, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. He has this line, he breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets the prisoner free. You know this hymn? Yeah, oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great redemption. He breaks the power of canceled sin. Um, the, the sentence doesn't flow in the right order, but there's a logic to it that has the order exactly right. What Charles Wesley is saying is, you have got sin in your life the power of sin is being exerted over your life in dreadful, life-destroying, self-destroying, other-destroying ways. That power needs to be broken. God's on your side, and God is on your side in breaking the power of sin. But what is step one? What is the first step that you can't skip, you have to do in order to break the power of sin over a creature's life? First, you've got to cancel it, right? First, you cancel the sin, then you break the power of it. You see the order there? Both are, uh, there, there's just no dividing them. I mean, they just go together. What God wants to do in your life is first cancel the sin. That's something only he can do. It's forensic, it's for the sake of Christ. Then he breaks the power of it. What does breaking the power of sin look like? It means you actually stop sinning, right? It's actually God's plan for your life is for you to, in fact, actually biographically be more like Jesus. How much like Jesus can you be? We're getting now into um, a doctrine we could label as glorification or the end point of salvation. Um, I think perfectionism is probably not true, so I wouldn't want to go around and say, um, you can be absolutely, utterly, totally like Jesus in this life. Um, I, I don't want to teach that because it's just a crazy-making doctrine. Perfectionism, it'll, it'll, really, it'll really mess with your head. Um, but I do want to say have high standards, like have high standards, study the life of Jesus in the Gospels and know that this is the template, this is the pattern, this is what God has in mind for you. And even if you say that's only possible, I don't know, maybe when I'm 80 and can't move to physically sin anymore. Um, no, even then I can carry out my favorite sins which are non-physical and all in my mind. Um, <laughs> even if you say, Probably that kind of Christ-like perfection is not possible until the resurrection body, until heaven, until after this life as it is currently constituted. Um, even if so, you're not putting it across a boundary so you can't feel it anymore. You've got to be saying that is in fact the goal. Perfection just means completeness. It just means when the work of God is actually carried out to completeness in your life. Um, okay, last point I want to make, um, redemption accomplished and redemption applied. Um, ooh, boy, that's good. I wish you could see what I'm seeing here. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's good stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, 1 Corinthians 2. I want to end with 1 Corinthians 2, 12 through 13. Just a couple verses Paul uses here. Paul says, Now we have received the Spirit, I mean, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God that we might understand the things freely given us by God. 
and we, he's talking here about the apostolic ministry, we impart these, this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the Spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. The key phrase I want to get in here, and this is for the doctrine of salvation, but it's also for the whole theological task. We have received the Spirit who is from God. Why? Why would God give His Spirit to us? Why have we received the Spirit who is from God? Well, here's one reason. I don't think it's the only reason, but it is a reason why I've received the Spirit of God. In order that we might understand, right? one of the offices of the Spirit is to increase our understanding. The Spirit is given to us in order that we might understand, and then listen to what we're supposed to understand, the things freely given us by God. So again, there's a two-step uh, integrated action here. First, God gives us things. Then he gives us the spirit so we can understand what he has given us. You see how Christian soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, is both a gift and a task. God gave you a bunch of stuff and then gave you the spirit, the divine presence itself dwelling within you as a new principle of life, in order to enliven your mind so that you could have accurate thoughts, accurate ideas about what it is that God has given us. It also implies that you could have inaccurate thoughts, right? That you could fail to be led by the Spirit, fail to be instructed by the Spirit, and misunderstand what has been given us by God. I almost want to say it's not enough for God to give us salvation if He doesn't give us the Spirit so that we can know what has been given to us by God. Right? He gives us salvation and the ability to understand it. Hebrews 2 says, Boy, the Old Testament was great, and that salvation was great. And the New Testament, the New Covenant, is so much greater and then the author of Hebrews asks this question, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Uh, it's kind of a rhetorical question. Uh, the main point is, don't neglect so great a salvation. That's the task side of what we've got as Christians. Um, to not neglect it, to not undervalue it, to not pick and choose among the parts of salvation so that we put together our own custom soteriology, uh, but to actually properly value what it is. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.